Uh, hello everyone and um, welcome to this whole education webinar on project-based learning with Homewood School and Sick Form Centre. Um, I'm Heather Tildesley, I'm a network facilitator um, at Whole Education and um, today we have Adam Lawson who's Assistant Vice Principal of Teaching and Learning and Head of Discovery College at Homewood School and Sick Form Centre in Kent and um, he's going to be talking you through some of the work that Homewood have been doing on project-based learning and um, so I'm going to hand over to Adam thank you. Hello everybody um, just give you um, a bit of um, if you like a uh, an overview of what um, Homewood School is. It's a, um, a secondary school in Kent, a comprehensive school, and obviously that's a, a selective area. So our intake's about 10 or 12 percent, sort of below a national average. Um, we are in a village called Tenterden, which anybody's ever village, um, visited, is quite an affluent area. But our, our catchment for our 2,600 um, strong cohort is South Ashford and all the surrounding villages. So we have quite a lot of um, rural deprivation as well. Um, and we've been having a go at project-based learning now for about 12 years or so. So what I was going to do is um, tell the story of that um, and then also talk about real projects and, and how we've engaged in those over the last few years. Um, and I, I've worked sort of, I started working at the school when project-based learning began here um, way back sort of 2004, 2005 time as a teacher and I've sort of risen up to the leadership through doing this. Um, so it's a bit of my sort of my story as well. So um, in 2004, um, leaders at the school come up with the idea of a, a total curriculum. We had a, a brand new building um, with large open plan areas where we would try and um, work with the innovation unit to develop project based learning. Um, a group of teachers went over um, to see High Tech High um, in San Diego and um, brought back some ideas and, and, they're, and they're, on the, they're on the first slide there pretty much. Um, what we wanted to do is try to respond to the needs of our students and create, give them the ability to problem solve, collaborate with each other, all those really important skills and, and, and create a, a system that, that was a, a little bit different. Um, what, what came along after that was um, that the school was also one of the um, initial um, system redesigned schools, which I'll, I'll talk about um, a little bit more in a, in a second. So this is one of the first things we wanted to do um, with the Total Curriculum. We wanted to present our work to an audience, um, an audience that um, might be more than the teacher. So we um, did projects and, and work um, across um, if you like subjects and we had the physical spaces, large open spaces to present work and we used to hold the exhibitions of work and we found that that improved um, students effort. What was also central um, to that, that we, we got involved a little bit more in our community and what was quite central to what we wanted to do was that um, we felt that our local area tends in our village, they weren't necessarily involved within the school so we felt a successful school, a successful key to say, three would have a permeability to the community. So we wanted to exhibit our work and add value to our local community. And also um, the project we should just see in front of you, which is a campaign for children need many years ago this picture is from. Um, it was a real authentic learning experience for our for our students doing 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 real real things. Um, then we come into the, the system redesign in um, two thousand and seven we um, we granted large amounts of money to one of the few system redesign schools in, in the country and um, while system redesign doesn't necessarily occur anymore, um, we do have we did have three elements which grew in our, in our project based learning. Um, the, the deep competencies which I hope still exist today and learning to learn um, back then was a, a big thing. Um, assessment for learning that students take control of, of, of what they do with opportunities um, to go deep but also opportunities to, to redraft and improve their work and, and to try and reach I suppose the buzzword, buzzword is mastery at the moment but back then that, that was why we weren't using that word, that's what we were talking about and that as much as possible students were, were learning in an active manner and you can see there are 1066 um, battered reenactment on the bottom left hand side of your screen and a, a sixth former um, giving some feedback to students there on their, on their work and in what we call a sort of critique process. Another thing that was, was quite essentially important um, to what we do was um, having one student with one device. Um, we got heavily involved in the e-learning foundation and um, if I tell you how old this photograph is, um, one of the young ladies there with a computer is now a teacher um, at the school and this is a year eight class. So um, this was um, now I think about sort of ten years ago. We had the um, so deal with Toshiba where our students had the opportunity to have these one single devices. Um, we therefore did away with textbooks at this early stage of the internet. Um, was our textbook. Today um, all our students in year 7 and year 8 have iPads um, which they use which are, are much more reliable than uh, these Toshibas used to be uh, um, years ago but that was quite essential what we wanted to do because it gave students those, 
independence to do um, the work. It allows us to integrate easily um, across subjects. And um, if you're not involved in the eLearning Foundation, it's certainly worth visiting their their website. Um, students do contribute to um, the cost of these devices, but um, in certain cases, if students um, are entitled to um, people free and free school meals, etc., then the um, price can certainly be reduced uh, in in that in that manner. So. Um, along came real projects, and we've worked at it's a total curriculum um, for a period of time, um, and we've learned a lot about our project-based learning. But perhaps real projects is when our um, project-based learning came um, to the forefront, and we kind of realised some of the mistakes that that we we were making. Um, lucky enough, we got to be involved with the innovation project once um, more, um, and with a group of schools that were trialling um, this project-based learning um, skill set in in the UK, um, and you generally by signing up to the real project, you got a project-based coach. Ours was John Bosselman, who was one of the lead teachers at High Tech High, and he worked with the school for two years to help us create a, a curriculum. Um, and it was pretty much based around two or three things. We just wanted all students to be capable of excellence, um, no matter what, where they come from and what their background were. And we just wanted to get students to do work that mattered a lot more beyond the grades and, and, and exams. And this was my second time round of kind of trying to implement project-based learning in, in a school. And so I, I learned a lot more about what I wanted to do this, this second time um, around. So probably the first thing, and the, and the first mistake we made was, if you expect students to, 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 to do creative work and make wonderful work, they need to have a voice and choice in, in what they do. And if we're really serious about engaging all of the students, then we certainly felt that students needed more choice. Okay, And some will opt for different areas in order to express themselves. But if you're really keen about engaging all first time round, we never gave students a choice in what they would do. The second um, thing is, a, is, a, is a, a public audience now. We made um, we always used to invite our public audience, which we got quite a few good links in the local community, really, at the end of the project. But it seemed that, it, that we needed to actually have our audience and our critique points set up halfway through, because quite often, if it was their first time ever presenting in front of an adult audience, or it was the end of their project, often the, the, the project or the presentation of work wasn't as attuned as it, as it could have been. So now we try and build in our audiences uh, as certain checking points along our, along our project routes. Um, and that, that's really helped the kids raise the game because you don't want them to raise the game for the end point where they're going to be sort of um, exhibit to the audience. You want them to, to raise their game of, along the line of, of, of doing this. The next um, element which we tried to make a fuss of was, um, I mean, when I was training, there was a the big thing, and it probably still does exist somewhere, about a three-part lesson. Um, when you're doing projects, the, the, the start is essentially really important. And so the entry event um, that we have is a real hook to get students engaged in this. We try to have a really big launch um, for our projects. And then the other thing is, um, and probably the most important change we've had to make, is project-based learning um, at the start, students started, oh, sorry, teachers started the project and then did very little throughout the project to support the students in what they were doing. Um, now for our planning and our better understanding of what we need to do, we are constantly critiquing and revising what we do to get near near perfect work and using the facilities that we have in the school um, to do that. Um, building in our, our AFL, our AFL time, sorry, our AFL time, and also giving sort of deeper learning competencies to how these um, people we're doing. It, it it is it is central to project based learning, and I know it sounds totally obvious to have it, but people that set out and from my experience of working with other schools is when you plan for doing project-based learning, this is the key element of it. You won't get good work over a six-week period unless you have constant check-in points and revisions of that work um, because otherwise, and what gives peer project-based learning the bad stigma is that what well, they've done six weeks and it's just as good as it could have been in two hours. So it's really important you have that outcome of high-quality work. Again, we wanted to have a, a permeability community here, some students here. Um, Right, I'm reading a, um, a, a story that they've written to, to a, a local primary school, um, and there's two elements of this. There's a permeability to the community, again, that we wanted to achieve, but there was also some of our projects were, weren't rigorous enough in their nature, so often we give them a professional role. So obviously these students are working as, as, as writers to perform that, and sometimes you can just turn a simple project or a simple lesson or set of lessons that you've got in your school just by changing that element to a, to a, a professional role. 
and next um, we've mixed our, our year groups up. Um, if all students are capable of excellence, then all students across year groups should be working with one another, uh, and that's been a, a massive use um, quite often. Um, and having a way to track that is, is obviously quite important. Then finally, um, we wanted to reduce um, workload for our, for our staff, and, and therefore we need to use as many people as possible in order to critique our workers as we go along and, and to mark and provide feedback. And so we certainly now insist that we would like a, a student assessment, a peer assessment, and an audience assessment before the teacher gets involved in formally marking that work. Um, it reduces workload, but it's also excellence for the students. So this is where we stand pretty much in terms of our, our, our project-based learning and our, and our deep learning um, responsibilities, really. Um, and this is how I've gone second time round, I suppose, into introducing um, project-based learning a little bit by stealth, because I find if you say the word project-based learning a lot, as I probably have during this present presentation amongst friends, um, you might struggle to implement it. But these are the things that I would make sure you have within your schools if you were looking to implement project-based learning. Now, the first one is an essential question. Um, and this is a very simple thing to do. You might have a scheme of work, for example, which is based around the Tudors, for example. Why not change that title of that scheme of work into a, a question which covers the whole topic, a question that could be answered at the end with a significant piece of important work. So instead of your topic being volcanoes or your topic being a book for that term, change it into a question that will be answered at the end of term. So there's a feeling of moving through a set of lessons to a purpose, because that's key um, to project development. The next thing, and most of the important thing, perhaps, that there is a significant content in there. You are driving the project from whatever the standards are within your institution. May you be an academy, may you follow the national curriculum, may you follow whatever. It must be driven from that significant content. Otherwise, it can be loose in terms of its implementation and, and get a bad rep as a result of that. This is probably one of the most important documents that, that I've seen, and it's something to ask yourself as a question, really, as you listen. How do you go about planning your schemes of work for a term? Um, this is a, what we call a back plan here, where you'll notice that on the, on, on the left-hand side that we start with what we are going to make at the end of term. And once we've decided on our product, we then plan backwards in terms of the, the skills that we want to assess. And then you'll notice the small boxes to the right. Well, there are lessons. Okay. Now, most people will do the lessons on the right-hand side first and then build up to the, the product towards the end. We decide on the product first and then plan our lessons afterwards to support that. They're the formative assessments. And essentially, that's why you have lessons, isn't it? To formatively assess, prepare students for the assessment. But we decide on what elements are going to be in that first. And therefore, if you've got a, a lesson which is not leading to that assessment, you can kind of cut it out in, in what you do and, and save time. Um, this is an ex excellent way of, of planning, planning first from the, from the project. And it helps you get a clearer view of um, where you might end up. Um, the next thing is um, peer critique and multiple drafts. We've, we've talked about this. And if you want to read any of Ron Berker's work, it will do it far better than the, I will be able to. But certainly. AFL is, is strong in the, in, in, in the classrooms in the UK, um, but also encouraging that, that multiple drafts that you're making something that is going to be publishable by the end of it, that we always say should not need to be marked because it is, the, it is of that standard. Um, and having those high expectations and building in those checking points is really important. I'll take you back to the initial slide there. There's nine elements of formative assessment into this project before it is created. And therefore, the final product should be excellent. And, and if you think about it, formative assessment is something that we do in our classrooms near enough every day. Um, I've talked about this already. Um, I've jumped ahead a little bit of myself. But this is kind of what we would expect, a self-assessment, a peer assessment, our outside audience assessment, and then finally a, a teacher assessment. It really does cut down workload, but also it kind of um, flatters the teacher a little bit. They're, they're the last port of call. When that work goes into the teacher, it should be of the best highest possible quality. The audience is, is a real struggle um, for us, it, depending on where you're located. Do your kids get bussed in any of your primary schools? Um, it's considerably easier because most of you just come from, from the locality. Um, and and it, it, it's hard to make links, but also get parents into C work, which is an important element of it. I'll, I'll come to authentic audience in a second. Um, 
student created a, a final product, the product must be excited, it must be real world, and it must be it must be useful. If you're going to if you're going to do a bit of writing, publish the writing within a book. If you're going to um, write a uh, a piece of music, then the music needs to be performed. If you um, are going to do a project um, in history, then it needs to be judged by historians or presented in a way that other people would see. Public exhibition there, I'll come into a second. This um, is a really useful side because when we started our project-based learning, we were based around exhibition and audience to an extent. Um, and if you, um, you've got the slides to look at later, but this is a little bit about a journey of how we move from audience to an authentic audience and from exhibition to a, to a public exhibition. So exhibition of work is great and audience is a great starting point, but this is if you want to become advanced in perhaps what you do in your projects, um, this, this uh, slide is, is, is of particular um, use. And then there's those things. I mean, at the, at the moment, um, there's, there's the buzzword in primary school, not necessarily a buzzword, but maybe a, a word that's more appreciated is being secondary ready. And being secondary ready seems to be a score, a scale score out of 100 at the moment. Um, in Discovery College at home at school in year seven, mate, we talk about being GCSE ready, but it's not a number. Um, we want deep learning competencies, and, and certainly that is what secondary schools will be asking of primary schools, and that's what GCSEs um, classes are asking of our year seven students, and, and these are the things that you will get assured with um, with, with project-based learning. Again, um, our central components of real projects, as you're building them, these, these are the simple things that, that you can build in. Um, multiple drafts, student could treat, that could easily happen. Um, to get people to think about making something or creating something at the end of the year, and if, you, if, there, if there is a bit of writing being done, that can easily be turned into an exhibition of, of some sort, or it could be made real. If students are doing a work that becomes real, then it adds it will add the, the, the impetus for them to do exceptionally well. Um, having that significant content and essential questions and changing your schemes of work, and then looking towards an audience. Okay, So build opportunities for student critique into your schemes of work. They may well already exist in terms of formative assessments. Decide on something you're going to make at the start of term with your series of lessons. Um, have significant content so it doesn't devalue what the project's all about, but also those essential questions for your scheme of work, and then focus on the exhibition and audience to really raise the standards of students. Now, to do this is not easy, and, and planning um, is certainly required. Um, we certainly believe in weekly collaboration for our, for our staff, and we shut early on a Wednesday afternoon to allow staff to be able to plan um, and, and do projects together, support each other, and, and work across um, subjects. And just to finish off, uh, the real projects team, um, who now only operate in a few schools within the UK, you can see them at, um, I believe, Stanley Park and School 21, um, and also XT School um, further um, north. They have a, a real projects website, which I hope you'll be able to see um, on, on the screen now. If I if I zoom further down, there is a they left us with a wonderful gift, which is uh, this here, a do-it-yourself. So if you are a leader within a school or a project-based learning lead, there is a, a step of six sessions here to allow you to implement project-based learning in your school. It has all the training um, opportunities available, and it's all free of charge. And there's nothing there for you, for you to use to implement in your school. And when I do project-based learning training for schools that they visit home with, um, that is um, the website that um, I use. And building through these sessions um, will give you a really good opportunity. There's web links in there, YouTube clips, and um, think pieces, but also real practical advice that I probably couldn't give in this um, short webinar today. So um, I think that is just around about 20 minutes or so. Um, Lovely. Thank you I'm so much, sure Adam. That, it was really clear, really thorough, and there's certainly a lot of avenues that people can sort of explore from, from where you've left off on each of those slides. Um, I would also no add worries. that um, Ron Berger and the expeditionary learning model, which a lot of the Real Project's yeah. work is based on, they actually have an expeditionary learning website as well, and that's got a whole right. lot of um, resources on that we discovered through our summer conference recently, so that's definitely yeah. one to, to make a note of. Um, I thought it was yeah. just really, really good how a lot of the essential components of project-based learning that you referred to are essentially about doing something a bit differently with little additional work for staff but just a, a high extra impact on student engagement so um, yeah, yeah it's certainly. really exciting it's fantastic so when um, Joe and uh, I've got a message from Joe Pashkin saying that was great thanks Adam <laughs> um, no worries. anybody on the line have any questions I have one very brief one if nobody else does 
um, and we will be circulating the slides after this webinar um, that Adam has been using. Okay, we're not getting any questions through, so just one thing that I wanted to ask um, was just about yeah. when you have students working across year groups, um, I wondered what yeah. the rationale was. Is it is it part of the having an audience, um, or is it about the skills they gain or the confidence they gain in doing that? Um, it's, it's not necessarily that. It's more that it shouldn't really make a difference what year group you're in, that all students are capable of, of, of excellent work. Um, and sometimes students need to model behaviours of older students in order to achieve that uh, and therefore working in groups and, and modelling their behaviours, particularly when, um, I don't want to offend any primary school teachers that are listening, but when they need to toughen up a bit for secondary school um, mm -hmm. and, and learn the, 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 the skills that are required for uh, within a secondary school, so in order to survive. It really helps students working with older year groups to gain those, those skills, gain those resilient skills to, to allow them to achieve more at an earlier stage because quite often students struggle with that transition between primary and secondary and there's a, there's a dip Definitely. at that point, but working from other sh older students kind of um, develops that. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just getting no thank worries. yous through, but no further questions. So thank you for your time, Adam, okay. especially, um, everyone else for joining at the end of a busy school day. Um, and this has been recorded, so we will circulate this um, recording and slides um, to everybody and to a few other people that have requested it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.